Hi guys, welcome back to another tutorial video on Apache Cassandra. In this video, we're going to continue to look at CQL. In particular, we're going to look at UUIDs or universally unique identifiers. And we're also going to look at counters in Cassandra. In database systems, we often want to generate a unique value to serve as the identifier or often primary key for a row. In traditional non-distributed relational databases, this is often done by incrementing a numeric value. This will be guaranteed to be unique as there is no contention between servers on its generation as there is only a single server. This is the approach we've been taking in our Cassandra tutorial so far, where the IDs are generated incrementally and are represented by a simple int. However, in distributed systems where there are many servers, this incrementing value becomes almost impossible to keep track of, especially when there are network partitions and failures. So instead, we use a universally unique identifier where the probability of generating a duplicate value of this is so low that it can be negated. In Cassandra, there are two forms of UUID, a normal UUID, which we will use when we are storing data and we just want to generate a guaranteed unique value without worrying about ordering. And we also have a time UUID, which again generates a unique value, but sorts our UUIDs in chronological order so they can be accessed using time values. So in order to use a UUID in Cassandra, we need to have a table where one of the columns has a type UUID. In most cases, this is either the primary key of the table or part of the primary key. So we will create a table in CQLSH using the syntax we've seen before. Create table, we'll give the table name, employee by UUID, and then we'll specify the names and the types of all the columns in the table. So first we'll have ID, which is of type UUID, and is also the primary key. We'll add two more columns, first name, which is type text, and last name, which is also of type text and are not part of the primary key. So once that table is created, we can see what's in the table using select star from employee by UUID. There should be no rows in this table at present. And as expected, there are not. So to insert data using a UUID into this table, we again use the insert into command. We specify the table name and we specify all the names of the columns we want to insert data into, which has to include the primary key. So we'll insert into ID, first name and last name. So all columns of this table. And then we have to specify the values we want to insert. So in order to generate a new unique ID, for each row, we use the function UUID with brackets, and this should generate us a unique ID for the row we are inserting. As usual, we can then specify the other columns in the table. In this case, the first name and the last name. So we'll insert this, and we'll again look to see if it has been successfully inserted. And we can see that it has been successfully inserted, and we can see the unique ID that has been generated for this row. So we will insert a couple more rows into our database using the same command, ID, first name, and last name. We are the columns we want to insert. And we can leave UUID as the function as this will generate a new unique identifier for every row we insert. So the only thing we need to change is the first name and the last name. That should insert another new row. We'll insert one more, again, leaving UUID to generate a unique identifier for us. And now we'll view all the rows we've inserted into the database. And we can clearly see that for every row, Cassandra has given us a completely unique identifier. Cassandra also supports time UUIDs, which use the time component of the UUID to sort the data in our database table chronologically. So to use this, again, we'll first create a new table and we'll call it employee by time UUID. This will be a very similar table to the table we created before. The only difference will be that instead of having an ID of type UUID, we will have an ID of type time UUID. And that will be, of course, the primary key and we'll keep the other two columns the same.
So that table has been created now. We can see that there's nothing in the table using the select star statement. And now we can add data as we did before to this new table using time UUID as the ID. So we want to insert into the database table name. And then we want to give the columns we want to insert into. Again, we'll give them all first name and last name and the values we want to insert into those columns. So this is where this differs slightly from inserting into a UUID. Instead of using the function UUID, we want to use the function now to generate us a time-based UUID rather than just a purely random UUID. And we'll give the names again of first name and last name for the employee. I added a semicolon there by accident. So that should insert Tim Jones into our employee by time UUID table using time UUID function now to generate the unique ID. And we'll again insert a couple more employees, keeping the now function the same as you want to generate a unique UUID for each new employee. So now we can use the select star to view all the employees in our employee by time UUID table. So the thing to note here is that the IDs are much more similar than they were in our original employee by UUID table. This is because the IDs in the employee by time UUID table use the function now to generate the UUIDs which means they have a similar time component as they were all created around a similar time. These will still be guaranteed to be unique, just like the UUID function, but as I said before, will allow us to sort these values on time when we are extracting them from the database. We'll compare these to the values we select from the simple employee by UUID table, and we'll see that the records in the employee by UUID table don't really share any noticeable similarities, unlike those in the employee by time UUID table. So as we can see, these three values down here are basically completely random, while these three values here have a very similar ending representing the time, while the start of the ID is different. We can also use counters in a Cassandra table. And a counter is a special type of column which is used to store an integer that changes only in increments or decrements. So we would use a counter for certain situations. For example, we might want to keep track of the number of items bought by a customer, or perhaps the number of views on a different web page, something that can increase or possibly decrease over time. Keeping track of counters in a distributed database is a challenge. This means that there are some limitations on counter columns in Cassandra. For example, they can only be created in dedicated tables and they can't be assigned to the column that serves as the primary or partition key. We also cannot index or delete a counter column. So tables that represent a counter usually consist of the primary key, which can consist of itself of one or more columns and then the counter column itself. And the counter column itself must have the counter data type. So in order to achieve this in Cassandra, we use the create table syntax we've seen before. So we create table and we might call this table, say, purchases by customer. Customer ID, because for every customer ID, we're keeping a counter of how many purchases that customer has made. As usual, we need to specify the columns, their name and data type that will be present in this table. So first we'll have ID and we'll use UUID as the type like we saw earlier in the video. And that will be the primary key for this table. But we'll also have a purchases value, which is a counter type, which means it's an integer that increases or decreases over time. Now, the interesting thing about counter tables is that data is updated rather than inserted into counter columns. And counter columns cannot be set, only incremented or decremented. So in order to add a new row to our purchases by customer ID, we in fact have to use the update command. So we want to update purchases by customer ID and we want to set the name of the counter column 
equal to the name of the counter column again, plus one to increment it by one. And then we want to give a where ID is equal to UUID to insert a new customer. So we'll run that and that should insert a new customer into our purchases by customer ID table with a unique randomly generated identifier and their number of purchases should be equal to one. So we can select star from purchases by customer ID in order to see that we have successfully inserted this database record. And as expected, we can see here that we have a uniquely generated ID and a number of purchases equal to one. We can use the same command to insert a number of different customers into our table, each one with a uniquely generated random ID. And we can use the select star statement to see that they have all been successfully inserted with purchases equal to one. If we want to increment the counter for a particular customer, we need to specify the ID in the where clause. So we use a similar statement as before, but instead of specifying where ID equals new UUID, we want to specify an exact UUID of one that's already in the database table. So we'll copy this and we'll paste it into our statement instead of the UUID function. So this should update to purchases by customer ID and set that customer's purchases equal to their current purchases plus one, where the ID is what we have specified. So we'll run that command and we'll again look at the data in our table and we should see that that customer's purchases should be now set to two. And as expected, it is. We can also simply decrement a customer's purchases by setting purchases equal to purchases minus one instead of purchases equal to purchases plus one. And again, we'll select all the data from the table to see that that customer's purchases has been set to one again. So thanks for watching this video on counters and UUIDs in Cassandra. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please don't be afraid to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment in the comment section if you've got anything to say.